How's it going, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Robbie Basil Show. Apologies for no episode on Tuesday. I think if you saw my Instagram story, you knew what was going on. Unfortunately, we, the last video had a lot of copyrighted material, and it was blocked from being posted, which um, I've learned my lesson. Uh, there's a lot of things that I read about, about what could happen in the future if I kept doing that action. So basal breakdowns will be on pause for now. There's another way that I have in mind of doing it. It's just going to be a little bit before we can try and go with that route. They'll probably see it in August. Um, maybe what, maybe here and there we'll maybe see it in August. But for now, it will be just me talking. We'll be able to show you the scores. We'll do all that the same. We're going to read through some articles today, actually. Uh, there's a lot of weird stuff going on at, after the finals of tournaments and stuff and quite frankly there's a lot of stuff that happened and that we will be taking seriously we will be reading through uh, articles there's lawsuits that were filed like it, it's gone out of hand and we'll read on the latest on some of the news today but before we start, let's hit the like button down below and subscribe. I really appreciate if you guys hit both. Uh, like I said, we're bringing, um, I, said, I think I said recently, but I don't know how recent. We will be bringing back uh, the like button, so hit the like button down below. If we hit five likes, we'll do a commentary of your guys' choosing. Last time we did it was absolutely chaos, but we have finally made it to our breaking point. We are going back to what happened on Sunday because it's been five days. I've been really taking a good look about uh, what happened uh, before, after both games because Copa America was something else, but the better tournament ended earlier in the day, and that was the Euros, and we had this final, which was absolutely chaos from, I think, the get-go, but people will debate me on that one for a while. Game was, I thought, pretty back and forth for a little while, but Spain, I thought, controlled more of it. Uh, um, it's like 60-40% in terms of domination, dominating the match. Nico Williams scored the opening goal. Cole Palmer gets subbed on late and scores to equalize. But Mike Oyathabal scores late 86th minute winner to send Spain to win their first Euros title since... Was it the E? I don't even remember when their last Euros title was. It's been a minute uh, since they've won a Euros. That's all you need. I believe it was Euro 2010. Uh, I think yeah, there's something. No. That was World Cup 2010. I don't remember. This is their first title since, I believe, World Cup 2010. Because recent Euro winners, I don't really remember what the last time they've won. It's been a minute. Uh, if we look at the Euros, the most recent winner of the whole th um, results. So the last time Spain won any of these was in 2012. And then when they went uh, back to back in 08 in 2012. So first aisle since 2012 uh, is actually run back from like 08 to 2012 where they won three titles in a row. 08 Euros, 2010 World Cup, and 2012 Euros a god squad that they had then, and they're possibly building something new. But the big things from this tournament for me to take away were, start with Spain. The run they had and the squads they were able to beat really made me think that they were going to be way more prepared than England for this match. And I think you kind of saw that. Having to go out there and, I mean, let's look, let's go back here. Let's look at how they got here. I mean, we could look back on this. Well, look at bracket view to really take a look at what they did. England's route, pretty simple. You had to beat Slovakia. They struggled with Slovakia. They struggled kind of with Switzerland. They had that late winner, late equalizer with Jude Bellingham. And then they played the Netherlands, late winner there, to beat the Netherlands. And they, they played Spain. Spain, I mean, yeah, they beat Georgia, which is probably easier than Slovakia, but they convincingly beat Georgia, and that's the difference with something like that. Then they beat Germany. They beat the hosts. Like, that's miraculous. They then beat France, 
because some reason France scored in regulation, which means they have to lose, and then they went out and beat England late. This tournament had the flair for the dramatic. It was the better tournament by a country mile. I saw videos recently saying like, oh, like the Portuguese fan, like, oh, this tournament sucked. A lot of, of own goals, sure. But I don't think that's the main headline from this whole tournament. And it's, to be honest, it's not really that close. The underdog stories in this tournament is what made this one more special to me. I'll, I'll name a couple of them. We'll start with a group winner, Romania. Yeah, they had to play the Netherlands, and they had their butt kicked by the Netherlands. But they made it to a Euro's knockouts after not, I don't think, making it back in 2020. You had Slovakia <clears throat> get here. You had... <clears throat> my apologies. You had Austria actually do something. You had Turkey actually win a, a knockouts game for the first time in a long time, or possibly ever for them. On the top half of the draw, because the bottom half, like pretty much everything else, be similar. Uh, you had Georgia in their first ever Euros make the knockouts. Slovenia, who had three draws, they made the knockouts, and they almost beat Portugal. They were just one shot, one Ben Sheshko, one v one away from beating Portugal. That was how close they were for, to being eliminated a couple of weeks ago. If you remember that, you had France, in, France's inability to score from open play. Spain, Germany being one of the greatest games I've ever seen. Watching it back, that game was the definition of miraculous. We actually have to talk about Spain again in a minute. But the underdogs, the Netherlands, who finished third in their group, yes, they had an easy path, but they made it to a semifinal and were so close to getting to a Euros final, their first final, I believe, since the uh, famous bout with Spain in 2010. So... There was multiple different storylines that you could have pointed at. And this tournament was truly something special in my eyes. And yeah, you could complain about, oh, Ronaldo sucked. Some of the big stars weren't great. Okay. That's not all people watch these tournaments for. It's, you can point for a million other things. And I think this tournament had a little bit of everything. You had some stars shine, brand new stars, rise to the occasion, and oh wait, this is certainly Lamine Yamal, who he still haven't had a chance to talk about yet. What a player. Simply just what a player he is. He's younger than me, he just turned 17. He's like, he was part of one of the bigger reasons, or a, a possible reason, why Spain won the tournament. He was amazing on the right wing. He was able to build up a lot of plays. He had an assist in the Euros final. He is a guy who I think will step rise to the occasion, will be a big part of Barcelona for years to come. That's just something that's been trending, I think, from the start of the tournament to now, and he's an absolute baller, and I think he's going to be great. He's going to be what Ansu Fatsi should have been, even though he's back at training with Barcelona, which... Okay, uh, Ansu Fatsi and maybe rising back to the level he was at. Because remember, Ansu Fatsi, that's a name I think it's a little bit foreign to people because he had a really bad year at Brighton. He still has the talent level to be able to get to a point where, not where Lamine Mall is. He's, I think he could have been better. He's a better version of Lamine Mall because when we started seeing from Ansu Fatsi was a big name star for Spain on the wing. Now we're seeing that again with Yamal, but hopefully he doesn't get destroyed like Fatsi did. That's the difference with the two. But this tournament had a lot, but there's a little bit of negativity that both tournaments shared. Other than players retiring, we saw the retirement of Muller, Cruz. We saw the Euros retirement from Cristiano Ronaldo and Pepe and a bunch of other stars, Shakiri who was a big name for Switzerland on their run to the quarterfinals. But this is where this video gets a little bit more serious about... I'll just briefly mention what happened because I don't know the whole thing. So, for those who love geography, Gibraltar is a small territory of nation recognized by UEFA that is right, like, I think in the southeast corner of where Spain is. Um, and there's a little bit of problems that I'm going to read... We'll share the screen and read it together. Just to show you how big of a problem this is. 
And there are, the chant is, Gibraltar is supposed to be part of Spain. Now, I don't know about the history about Gibraltar and Spain right now. I know they don't like each other. But essentially, uh, players from Spain's winning team have led crowds and chants of Gibraltar is Spanish. Uh, Gibraltar made an official complaint about the celebrations to the U to UEFA, describing them as extremely provocative and insulting. Fair. Gibraltar is an ex enclave at Spain's southern tip that has been under British rule since the 18th century, and Spain has been long calling for its return. There you go. There's the problem. The chanting came as tens of thousands of Spanish fans gathered in central Madrid on Monday to greet the players after their win over England in Sunday's final. Waving flags and dressed in Spain's traditional red and yellow strip, the fans cheered as the players made an open bus tour. Yes, sick. They ended in the square where the trophy was presented. Rodri was then seen chanting Gibraltar in Spanish alongside the aforementioned Lamine Yamal and the previously should have been mentioned Alvaro Morata, who did absolutely nothing in the tournament. The Gibraltar FA fairly complained on Tuesday about the team's behavior, saying in a statement that it is noted the extremely provocative and insulting nature of what the Spanish national team did winning Euro 2024. Football has no place for behavior of this nature. It is 100% right. Okay. Quick thing on this. The fact that this happened with both teams that won something, not the same, but like some ridiculous action happened after the match where the team chanting something, that has no place in the game. And I think we will hear some, maybe something from Rodri. I haven't really researched enough on this to really comment on this very much. The other one we'll read a little bit more with Enzo Fernandez in Argentina. But stuff like this is interesting, but they set it in a wrong environment, and it's just a whole weird situation in general. And what I mean by that is because, personally, one, Gibraltar is, British, is a British overseas territory, which is already more interesting, and it was ceded to Britain by Spain in the perpetuity perpetuity at the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713. So, uh, it's, it's people have twice backed British rule in referendums, but Spain has maintained a claim on the territory, which just makes this even more dramatic. So, it's been weird, the whole, like, I don't really know enough about this, but I know Spain wants Gibraltar back, and they tried to do it during a, a European tournament, and players could maybe, could maybe get in trouble for this. I don't know if they will, but just to tell you how bad Gibraltar is, there's the bottom in it. It finished bottom of its Euros qualifying group with zero points, including a 14-0 loss away to France, because that makes sense. Um, Gibraltar has been a full member of UEFA since 2013, so they've like fielded teams for Euro, 20, uh, Euro 2016, World Cup 2018, Euro 2020, World Cup 2022, and now in qualifying for this too, and it's not really qualified for anything, and it's really bad. It's just a weird situation entirely, and it's something that doesn't really belong in the game, so it's kind of weird. It's just something that happened that I just wanted to bring to people's attention, and it's not the only thing that happened. But the tournament as a whole, barring what happened at the end, was good. I mean, there's a lot of dramatics. We had pure insanity we had a lot happen and you could say the same about what happened in miami and we're gonna try to find an article we're gonna read an article from what are we gonna read an article from today maybe espn because those are my guys um and we'll Briefly read what, um, it's actually Microsoft, which actually went down earlier, which is kind of funny. But we'll read what Microsoft has to say for us. And it's this headline. Copa America Final delayed after fans rush gates. Let's take a look at this. Um, the start for the final of the 2024 Copa America between Argentina and Colombia was delayed over 75 minutes. Essentially, we'll, we, won't, we won't read the whole thing. We'll let you guys read the first two paragraphs. Essentially, unticketed fans from 
they claim it was like more Colombian. I'm not going to assume who did more of, of this action. Raided the stadium as people without tickets to try and get into the game, which makes this tournament even more stupid. The Copa America has had enough controversy. We'll kind of list a couple of them here. Poor fields, poor officiating. The games haven't been that good. I mean, the fields aren't even regulation size for a FIFA tournament because the fields aren't built or haven't undergone the renovations to be ready to play a FIFA tournament yet. But haven't been not ready for the World Cup, and now we have this. The game was delayed till 9.22, so that's the only reason I was able to watch this thing. Argentina did win 1-0. We'll go over the match later, but that's not the big thing we're talking about. And we'll read what this says. The delays before the kickoff began when earlier in the day, video on social media showed fans breaking through the southwest gate at Hard Rock with some being tackled or otherwise apprehended by police and security personnel. Uh, this has led to a lot of other stuff that we'll read about afterwards, just to tell you how weird this thing could get, or nasties could get. Stadium went on lockdown briefly before Hard Rock issued the following statement. In, in anticipation of tonight's final, thousands of fans without tickets attempted to forcibly enter the stadium, putting other fan security and law enforcement officers at extreme risk. Okay. You're probably asking yourselves, Robbie, whose fault is this? Is it U.S. soccer? Is it CONCACAF, Condombol, the United States military, the police of Miami? Whose fault is this? I've done the research, and as much as I thought this would be on U.S. soccer, it's not. The blame for something like this will go on Condombol, which is like the governing football body for South America. They made the security plan for how to, before the match, for how to deal with the fans. Because there's supposed to be a lot of them, since it's a massive final. And it was just like one line of security and nothing really else. And then this happens. So I would say, and yes, is it U.S. law enforcement? Yes. But it's Condembo's plan to address how to use said law enforcement. So that's where the confusion comes into play a little bit. Because after reading it all, Condumble came up with the terrible plan, which just makes Condumble even more in, in the mud, because we'll read why later. We'll talk about the match next. Um, but this whole thing just continues the trend of how bad this tournament is, or tournament was. Yes, we saw a lot of quality players on the field. Messi got injured, and we'll talk about that too. Everything went wrong that shouldn't have gone wrong. Messi injury, we can't get around that. But officials being bad. VAR being kind of useless. Not having the part of the needed things for VAR to work efficiently in an international tournament. That stuff can't happen. This is just icing on the cake. And the cherry on top... Is and like the sprinkles you would put on something like this is just coming because we're not even done with the controversy yet. But thousands of fans were or fans being arrested. You had fans reach they breached the gate. Here's the video of it. Uh, Colombian fans breached the gate. We have fans going to air ducts. This thing was outrageous. Um, they said that the initial rush of fans that the gates were locked down. But, yeah, some of this stuff got really out of hand. People needed medical treatment. And the issues with fans, we saw this trend when Colombia played Uruguay on Wednesday. When fans... Darwin Nunez... I've given him a lot of crap, okay. But Darwin Nunez did some war general type stuff. That's not even the right term for this. He went into battle... With Colombian fans, because of what they're like, the Colombian fans like came to where the families were and they're saying a lot of stuff to the families and whatever. Darwin Nunez jumps in the stands and almost looks like he's about to fight people, which fair play, Darwin Nunez. And then you have this. It's a terrible what happens here. And that type of stuff, we're not even going to get to how bad it could get for Condomble. But we'll go to the match next. Well, nothing really happened. Uh, the final sucked. This game was terrible. 
Lautaro Martinez uh, scores a late winner. 1-0, 114th minute winner in extra time. Good through ball through the middle of the pitch. Argentina beats Colombia. Argentina deserved to beat Colombia. People could complain about officiating, which is just a perfect way to complain about this type of a match. And here's what I'll say to that. That should not be an excuse for Colombia for how undisciplined they were. Was Argentina as disciplined? I don't think so. Looking back on some of the tackles, I thought they were... I mean, the referee was playing advantage. I think he did some of that right. Should more stuff have been called on Argentina? Absolutely. You could sit after any match. But you have to understand that this is a final in Condomble. Nothing is being called in a final in Condomble. And there are fouls. I mean, if you have a player, just imagine this. Here's your regulation pitch. Okay. You're on the, the byline, which is the, the line where the goal is. On your byline as a defender, shielding the ball away right towards a corner flag, and you get hit and you fall. That's an automatic auto foul call. 100%, nine, I mean, 99% of the time that will be called. That's just situational. It's a tactical foul. It, it's not really even tactical, it's a situational foul. And yes, should there have been more cards? Definitely. But this played out kind of how I thought it would in terms of aggression, in terms of yellow cards. There's not a lot a referee can do in a game like this, I'll be honest. And the icing on the cake, Argentina did win, so people already think it's rigged. The injury to Lionel Messi, I think it was an ankle sprint, uh, ankle injury. Uh, I mean, I heard M an MLS club, Chicago, uh, a Chicago Fire, might refund... Uh, tickets because of Messi not playing which fair play to them I don't know the whole story on that one either I just found out about this but this whole situation with the Copa well, we're not even done talking about how bad this could get for certain nations particularly Colombia we'll explain why in a minute but more or less uh because we got word today that there could be lawsuits, there could be a lot happening at the end of this, and this will not end for a little bit. But what happened afterwards? What was the first bit of news to come out after Argentina lifted the trophy? Back to Colombia. And this is essentially what it is. I actually have to bring this back because we have to close an ad. Sorry, Reese's. Uh, sponsor your boy, by the way. I love Re uh, Reese's would be a fun sponsor. But here it is. Colombia's soccer president facing charges after Copa America arrest in Miami. This stuff is is miraculous. Colombia's soccer federation president and his son are facing battery charges after getting arrested at Miami's Hard Rock Stadium moments before the final. Ramon just, we'll call him Ramon. We got Ramon. And Ramon Jamil. Uh, yeah, Ramon and the son. There you go. Uh, they spent jail in, in, Sunday night in jail. Father and son duo were arrested and charged with battery. Uh, it was totally unfair. And again, we were humans. Anything could happen. But they started it first. It was ridiculous. I mean, sure. This credential for me, it says total access. And the security guard, one of those who wanted to feel important, didn't, didn't recognize it. Okay. This is where it gets stupid. The police said the father and son got physical with two security guards and a woman who was trying to intervene during the chaos at the Copa final. Okay. Yes, we're the, I mean, it's, they had passes. You got physical with a security guard. You're a federation president. Sure. That's your title. But you're not entitled to go out and physically get physical with two security guards. What are we doing? Like, come on, man. 100% fans, yeah, they stormed the, the field, the store of the stadium. They appeared in bond court along with others who were arrested. 27 people were arrested prior and 55 were ejected from stadium grounds. Um... Yeah, well, I got this guy Fernando Perez. I actually heard about this. He told he got uh, unlucky. Uh, people were pushing in. I mean, he got okay. Some of the arrests were for nothing. This, I think, is the bigger note. 
I mean, the guy was charged with battery on a police officer and resisting arrest. Okay. I mean, the mayor said she was outraged by the chaos. Yeah, she's going to probably get a lot more heat from this. But the moral of the story is not have ads on your screen. The moral of the story is don't do what these people did because I think it's more of not who of what happened, but people thinking they're entitled. Getting physical with a police officer just shouldn't happen. And I mean, is it unfair? Maybe. But I think it's something more about them believing they're entitled. Now, I have nothing against Ramon and the son, personally. I never met them. They could be good people after. On and just have one bad moment, sure. But the reputation of your football federation might be in shambles after this, along with co a condom bowls and possibly conca calves. But you figure that part out because then we had this, and this happened today. And I'll try and have the minimum amount of ads for this part. Because this is just adding insult to injury. Copa America fans file lawsuits against organizers after the chaotic finale. Angry ticket holders have filed several lawsuits in federal and circuit courts against Co Copa America organizers. First of all, I was wondering when this was going to happen because I had a feeling this was going to happen. And I think this is... Is this, this could end really bad. In all, the lawsuit seeking millions of dollars in damages for alleged negligence in maintaining crowd control. Sue Condom Bowl. I mean, that's what they're doing, essentially, for Copa America organizers. Condom Bowl. Uh, and it allowed many fans without tickets to enter the venue. While many other tickets tickets were denied entry. Some of the sweet sights injuries as well. Oh, and uh, for, I almost forgot to mention, the stadium got partially destroyed. Escalators were destroyed. A lot of stuff ended really bad. Uh, this dude, Das Noble, was listed as the lead plaintiff on uh, in a fi Friday filing in southern uh, Florida. Uh, class action lawsuit meaning more fans could join the suit if the judge grants such status, which would probably happen. The suit was filed against South Florida, uh, the oper uh, South Operators of Hard Rock. I don't know why. Uh, Condomble, CONCACAF's going to get thrown into this, uh, which is unfortunate because CONCACAF like, has like no money. Is just there. Condom Bowl should be the main ones in this, and I think they probably will be. Um, along with uh, Best Crowd Management. I don't know who that is, but that's just unfortunate for them. It's been overwhelming. Uh, it's really bad. And there's another photo of it. You guys can watch the other videos. Uh, fans who purchase tickets on the primary market or deny entry to the match are encouraged to reach out to Ticketmaster to request a refund. Knowing Ticketmaster, I don't know if that will happen. CONCACAF and Condomble not commented. Mon on Monday, this is why I re remembered. Condomble said it was subject to the decisions made by the Hard Rock Stadium authorities, which they're just trying to get out of this. Um, yeah, the cues were, ridic were like ridiculous. Um, yeah, essentially, this could get out of hand really badly for Condomble. And the other organizers, because, and I'm be honest with y'all, you can get really nervous about the World Cup. I can't blame you guys, but with Conkic, this is a, you know what? There is one bright thing about this. With the World Cup being in two years, Conkic may have figured it out on how the hell to manage the crowds for the World Cup because of this. If there's one shining thing at the end of this, is that CONCACAF and FIFA have figured out maybe, uh, at least they know how to not handle it, was do whatever Condomble thought of. But this whole tournament was a mess. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Get this off my screen. Let's go to a more positive thing. Uh, Wimbledon. We won't even pull it up because we'll briefly talk about the Wimbledon final because I have it on Sunday. Uh, Alcaraz, uh, other than the one blunder, uh, dominated the match against Novak Djokovic to secure the Wimbledon championship on the men's side. The women's champion, the women's champion was uh, Krechkova, and we talked about that on last Saturday's video. So it's almost been a week since I uploaded. I just realized that now, but it was full domination um, 
from Carlos Alcaraz. We saw a lot of notable stories, the immersion of some of the, some young players, some vets making some legitimate noise. And it'll be interesting when we go back to hard court season, which can, begins this week, how some players look on hard courts. Because the grass courts, especially at Wimbledon, they're really slow. So we might see some bigger serves. Some players be able to have a lot of speed. I'm really excited to see how that goes. We might we'll possibly talk about hard court season and who to watch out for that uh, next week. But we have a lot more to talk about. So that's why I rushed a little bit through the Wimbledon Championships. Uh, the Championships Wimbledon, but... Alcaraz wins the men's side. Kreshkova wins the women's side. I was wrong on both of them. GG's there. But this is the one negative about getting uh, the video taken down from Tuesday. We didn't get to see my open predictions. And I'm going to be honest with y'all. I'm quite happy you didn't see who I picked because I think everyone missed the cut. Here's what's been the main headlines of the Open. Shane Lowry, the 2019 winner at Royal Portrush, leads the Open by two shots over Daniel Brown and Justin Rose. You're probably asking yourselves, Robbie, where is the hell is all the scoring? There's not a lot of it. Here's your top seven uh, featuring big names like Scotty Scheffler, former star in Billy Horschel, Justin Rose, who's had to qualify for this thing. Corey Connors, he's won on the PGA Tour. Jason Day, former PGA champion. Xander Shoffley, he's been in the mix of a lot of Opens in the past. But what's been the biggest headline of this tournament? Well, it's very simple. The conditions and the lack of scoring. So the conditions there, there's been rain, there's been 30 mile an hour winds, and it's resulted in not a lot of scoring. For the most part, I mean, the first day was led by Daniel Brown, who got kind of lucky. I mean, he shot... Let's look at Daniel Brown. We'll click on Daniel Brown. Uh, this was his second round scorecard. Shot 72. But round one, he went bananas. He went out and shot a, a six under uh, 65 to lead at the open. But then round two, he kind of fell off a little bit. The winds really got to him, especially on the back. Uh, right around here. Uh, he bogeyed 17. Kind of unfortunate. And he struggled on four, which is a big struggle hole for a lot of players. At hole nine. So, 72, not the end of the world, but we'll take a look now at Shane Lowry, who had a decent day today, shot 69. He leads the tournament. Round one, bogey free again. So, the scoring was really there yesterday. Today was mainly about survival, and Shane Lowry did that. The fifth hole, another hole a lot of people struggled on, and the 11th hole were not his favorite, but to be fair, he got a little unlucky at 11, but. There's your score. Uh, I think a camera was being moved when Lowry hit. I don't remember the full story on that one, but Shane Lowry leads. What are some notable uh, th notable things from today? Um, big thing, lack of scoring. I mean, if you look at the rounds, best rounds of the day, there's a lot of three-unders. Jorge Campilo, Campil 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 Gary Woodland, Patrick Cantlay, Jason Day, Billy Horschel, Justin Rose, all shot three under par. But when we scroll down here, there's not many names that shot uh, under par today. I mean, the most, I mean, you have your Scotties, your Corey Connors in the, who are in the mix. John Rahm, I watched a lot of John Rahm today in the afternoon session. He looked pretty solid, was able to make a lot, hit a lot of quality shots. The putting today was a struggle for a lot of people. But when you scroll all the way down here, especially the guys who missed the cut, the scores get really bad. And we'll just show you one of them. Uh, Roman Lang Langosk uh, retired on the eighth hole, which is a par 318 yards, but it's called the postage stamp. Uh, it's the smallest green on tour, and he retired on that hole. Uh, unlucky for this dude, he shot plus 20 today. So for reference, uh, I would have beaten him if I played in the Eisenhower Park Blue Course scores with against him. I would have beaten him today, so... Shout out there if that made any sense. Tony Finau played awful. He shot plus 10, missed the cut. Uh, he shot, I believe that's an 81 on this course. Wyndham Clark played bad today. But he's had two bad days in a row. We'll scroll up a little. Minwoo Lee, a popular pick for me. I love picking him, but he did not have a good day at all. The tournament really at all. This is where the fun part is. There's Victor Hovland. He shot plus 6, plus 10 on the week. Uh, there's Tiger. He shot plus 14. He's gone. 
Uh, Ludwig Aberg, another shocker to miss the cut. He shot plus nine. Then we're going to get into the Rory McIlroys, who, to his credit, finished really strong. Uh, shot two, two under on the back nine, but his start, big surprise that he struggled that much. Bryson DeChambeau, another one, plus nine. Tommy Fleetwood, plus nine. Those are the two favorites that I would have picked, were Tommy and Bryson. They both played awful. Uh, we'll keep scrolling up. Got to find Jordan Spieth because he had a, 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 a Justin Thomas. There's Justin Thomas. So at the end of the first round, he shot 68. Round two, he shoots a 78. So 10 shot difference, including bogey. He's shooting a 45 on the front nine, to sh leading to him shooting a 78. He's now at plus four. So the scoring today was near irrelevant. But at the end of the day, once again, we'll show you the leaders. It's Lowry from Brown, Rose, Horschel, Burmeister, Scheffler, and Connors. Uh, along with Xander Shuffley, uh, Jason Day, Patrick Cantlay. So there's not a lot of players. There's 10 players under par currently. Who do I like to win this tournament out of these 10? Uh, big name for me will be Shane Lowry. I mean, the Open in 2019 had similar conditions, I felt like. Other than today, we didn't have something that bad. But Shane Lowry... Irishman knows how to adapt to conditions like this. He plays in Europe a lot. I think he would be one of the favorites for this. Uh, Xander Shoffley, uh, even though he's six back, with the way anything can go, uh, I think he would. How good he could strike the irons and how well he can putt, I think Shoffley would be another big favorite for this. As you scroll down, Brooks Kepka. I mean, he's. I believe he's won. The, I don't know if he's actually won this before. Um, he had a bad taste shot plus two, but I think he could be in, in the mix. Colin Morikawa. Previous winner of this. I think he can be in the mix. John Rahm, too. Uh, there's a lot of names down here. Nikolai Hoygaard, who on his day can go and shoot 800 and be right back in the mix. This tournament is nowhere near done. And that's what I absolutely love about this. Because with the way conditions can change so fast in a tournament like this, anything, and I mean anything, is truly remotely possible. And that's what I'm very excited for for the rest of the way. But if I had to pick someone to finish the deal, it has to be Shane Lowry. I mean, he's off to a two-shot lead. He's going to be in a comfortable spot heading into tomorrow. He'll have the lead probably when he starts, honestly. Because, uh, I mean, one and two have been playing, like, decently well. But after that, everything goes to crap for the most part. So, it will, it will be interesting, though. But I do like Lowry. He's been so good so far. A race that double bogey, he's a four-shot lead. So... I like the situation that Shane Lowry is in, so I would say he would probably win this. Finally, uh, we have the Hungarian Hungarian Grand Prix, and we're just going to look at the practice uh, numbers from today, and uh, using these numbers, come up with a prediction for the race on Sunday, as well as a qualifying order for tomorrow. So, here are the time... Hold on. Add again. Um, here is the FP1 times. Start there. Uh, Carlos Sainz leads the way by two tenths. Charles Leclerc is in third. Uh, he actually finished 18th in FP2, so we won't have to talk about that one. Uh, Max is there on the mix. Lando Norris down in sixth with Piastri in seventh. Zhou Guan Yu, the big surprise here, uh, up in fifth for Kick Sauber Ferrari. Uh, Yuki Tsunoda is up here. Hamilton, 10th. Remember last year, Hamilton got pole here. So that's an interesting one to watch out for. Danny Rick scrolling down here. Uh, Ollie Behrman actually got the sit in the hash for Nico Hulkenberg today. Uh, also, Logan Sargent, 16th. Shout out, Logan Sargent. Uh, FP2, dominated by Lando Norris. He is at the top with Max and Carlos. We'll probably see a combination of those three near the top. Big surprise in session two was Kevin Magnuson. He finished in sixth. Hamilton Starting to trend back up. Uh, up in P7. If you start from the bottom and work our way up. Joe is bottom. So make it make sense. I can't do that for you. And there's Leclerc down in 18th. Uh, Hulkenberg 15th. I'm not expecting a lot out of Haas this week to be honest. So who is my uh, projected poll uh, and the race results? So let's go into this right now. Uh, my projected race winner is Max. I think he will get back on track. This has to be a race where he gets back on track. Because Belgium, anything's possible. It's Belgium. Uh, a lot of possibilities. 
to where Red Bull can even get more back on track, I think would be Belgium, along with McLaren, who I'm not that high on this week. Uh, I would say Max gets pole. Then I would say Carlos and Lando, 2-3, with Russell and Hamilton, 4th and 5th, Piastri, 6th. Uh, Leclerc, I think, would get in the top 10, but I don't think he would qualify very well. And I'm not, still not high on Sergio Perez, even though he had a decent day today. Um, and then the race, I'm going to say Max wins with Lando blowing it again in second. Sainz third. Hamilton fourth. And then the rest could, could go really anywhere, honestly. Um, well, one odd prediction, like an interesting one. Uh, I like where Albon and Williams are after their FP2 times with uh, Sargent and Albon. I think both of them could maybe get into Q3 this week. I think that's a big possibility for them. I'll be honest. Uh, Danny Rick, I think that, that RB could be on the up as well. Even the Yuki Sonoda uh, had, was 19th in FP2. So I don't know what's going on with them. But I think really anything is possible at Hungary, I mean, heck, recently at Hungary, we've seen only one car start the race, and everyone else start from the pits. I mean, actually, I think it was like lap, no, it was like lap three, maybe? I don't know. If you know the Hamilton moment from 2021, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But truly, anything is possible in Formula One, and it should be a fun time. But for but unfortunately, that's where our time ends today. That is the end of today's episode of the Robbie Basil Show. If you, if you like what you see, hit the like button down below and subscribe to the channel. But for now, I'm Robbie Basil saying so long. Enjoy your weekend. See you guys next time. Goodbye, everyone.